hear me? Yep. Great. Um, I had a perfectly <laughs> decent panel, and then Jay came in and stole my thunder. Um, <laughs> That, I guess that can happen. Um, so uh, thanks for coming to the session. You'll know, of course, that TCPA really founded Jernaya, so all that awesome stuff that you heard in there <laughs> was fundamentally funded by the debenture represented by TCPA, so don't forget that. But uh, more. Uh, exactly. Um, real quickly, how many people here have some kind of compliancy function? Okay, how many people here have a marketing function? Okay, how many people in this room are engineers? Good, okay, we can make progress with that. Um, so before we make progress with that, uh, I'm just gonna have the panels do their own introduction because uh, I'm sure they'll do better than I can. Um, sure, I'm Deborah Solmar, I'm, I guess I got it up there, I'm the Deputy General Counsel for Litigation and the Chief Compliance Officer for Career Education Corporation. Um, we own American Intercontinental University and Colorado Technical University. Um, being here, all, all us lawyers, we don't have any pictures, we don't have any graphs, we don't tell jokes, but we will still try to make this interesting and entertaining. We will try. Hi, everybody. I'm Terry Gonzalez. I'm a uh, partner at Steptoe & Johnson. Uh, I am outside counsel. All the three here are in-house lawyers. Uh, my practice really is uh, three things. Uh, commercial litigation. I represent uh, corporations who have been sued or in trouble. Um, I do a lot of responses to uh, government investigations and regulatory inquiries and internal investigations. And lo and behold, I do a fair amount of uh, work uh, defending companies who've been sued in TCPA cases. Excellent. Um, I'm Rebecca Blavalil. I'm the Chief Compliance Officer with Guaranteed Rate. Uh, guaranteed Rate, depending on the numbers you look at, is the 12th largest mortgage lender in the country. Um, and we do a fair deal of, of lending that's generated from our digital mortgage. Great. Um, so. Uh, my next question for you all um, is how many people here like getting unwanted phone calls? Really? <laughs> really? Um, okay, so two people in the back. I'd like um, your number. <laughs> so, the, so the thing about uh, TCPA, and uh, Chris and I were talking about this uh, beforehand, is unwanted phone calls is the macro, the superset, right? TCPA is a subset of unwanted phone calls. Nobody in this room wants unwanted phone calls. Uh, very few people in, in this that room <laughs> want. Very few people in this room want to sell branded clients unwanted phone calls, whether that's called TCPA compliance or not. I don't. I definitely don't want to purchase from a publisher network unwanted phone calls and sell those to branded or unbranded clients. Right? That's just dumbass.com. So like, so, so. Getting unwanted phone calls, processing them, or having people make them, is that's really the problem we're trying to solve. Um, TCPA is the government's way to solve part of that problem. So what I would submit to you is if we talk about TCPA here, I would think about the bigger problem, and I would think about the technology and the processes that you can run to prevent people from getting unwanted phone calls from anybody that's affiliated with you, because you don't want them and you don't want to make them. Does that make sense? Um, so before I do that, who is the engineers in the room? Okay, I might call on Rich. Uh, how many people in the room are familiar with the concept of availability? Not the Tinder one, the other one. <laughs> the mathematical concept of availability, there's 365 days in a year, right? If there's 365 days a year and you're 90% available, how many days a year are you not available? Rich? 36.5, so if you're a 90% compliant person and you're operating in a 24-7, 365 world and you're getting an A, you're getting a 90%, that means a month out of the year you are out of compliance. Whether we're calling that TCPA, whether we're calling that unwanted phone call, whether just whatever the measurement of unhappiness is, and Rich, if you're 99% compliant, how many days are you out of compliance the year? 3.65. So you can do a lot of work, and, and we were talking about this ahead of time, you're never gonna be 100% compliant. So part of this, for the marketing people in the room, when the compliance people say, we can't have any insert issue, TCPA, we can't have any unhappy customers, we can't get any letters from a government, that's unobtainium, right? That is unobtainium, you cannot buy zeros, you can buy nines. So you can buy nines of people, process, and technology, but the biggest thing you can take away from here, you're not gonna be 100% compliant. And the dumbest thing that can happen is you lose an entire channel, which is calls, because 
Somebody in compliance gets confused about math, right? It says we gotta be 100% compliant. There is no such thing, you can't buy that. And you do not wanna shut down an entire marketing channel just because someone doesn't understand the concept of availability and the Wikipedia page is pretty informative. Um, so, thank you, Jeff. Um, so against that background of reality and math uh, and the larger unwanted calls problem, I mean, Terry, I'll start with you. Uh, TCPA, problem getting bigger, problem getting smaller, what do you see from where you sit? Uh, it's, it's amazing, but the number of TCPA cases being filed year after year continue to grow. I, I, I said it last year and I said it the year before, but every single year, the number of federal lawsuits filed under the TCPA increase. Um, I read this article very recently from the Institute of Legal Reform that kind of did a fairly in-depth analysis of the types of litigation and the numbers around TCPA litigation. And since the 2015 FCC order, the number of lawsuits that have been filed has increased by 46%. And 2017, that number's are gonna be close to well over 4,000 lawsuits. And that doesn't include arbitrations and demand letters. So the amount of litigation in the TCPA state space is really uh, astounding. Now, that's not because you all are doing, on the compliance side, doing a bad job, and it's not because the tech, including Jernia's, hasn't gotten better, it has. But there's bad people in the, there's not only the unwanted phone call, there's people that claim that it's an unwanted phone call. Uh, I know, you know, Terry, you probably dealt with that, Deborah, you probably have. You wanna talk about professional plaintiffs at all? They're out there. <laughs> Um, and apparently I was wrong, we do tell jokes, or at least you tell jokes. Right. Um, sure, I think one of the, you know, you, you kind of run into different sort of different categories of people that are suing you. The professional plaintiffs, these are people who, I think we've talked about this at, I know I see a lot of familiar faces, I know we've talked about this at other conferences, um, people that just basically, you know, sign themselves up, fill out lead forms, wait for the phone calls, and then, you know, basically make a living suing under the TCPA, and I think you know, kind of what to take away from that is one of the reasons, to Marty's point, about not having to do with whether you have good compliance, um, good compliance practices. Good compliance practices are still likely to result in litigation, and, and one of those reasons is without, you know, trying to stay away from being too legalese, is that it's a, it's a fairly easy statute to plead in a lawsuit, and it's difficult to get out of it as a defendant at a very early part in the litigation. So, it, and if you, if you did violate the TCPA, there are damages. I mean, it's very easy to plead, it's easy to prove if there is a violation. So it's, it's, a, it's a lucrative space for plaintiff's lawyers to be in and for people to, you know, to people to initiate litigation. So to Marty's point, all the great, we should have great compliance. As lead buyers, we want our lead sellers to have good compliance. We have good compliance procedures, but you know, even the most perfect compliance procedures, um, if they do exist, which we can debate, um, are going to likely result in litigation and demand letters regardless, I think. And so in that easy pleading environment, Rebecca, we were talking about this, like, uh, does where the words appear in relation to the button thing matter? Right, so it's an interesting discussion, right? So where should you get your consent? So when you fill out the form, you've got your phone number box, and then you're gonna have a place where they're gonna click the button. Um, you can put the language above the button, you can put the language below the button, you can put the language someplace else on the page. Um, but if you put the language someplace not near that button, you are probably going to, to face a lawsuit. You know, essentially, um, that's not, you know, it's not prominent. The, the language needs to be clear and conspicuous and it needs to be prominent. So what I tell our marketing folks is that keep it above the button. Um, the other thing to think about when you're thinking about where the language is on the page, um, if you're not gonna have it above the button, look at what your page does on different devices. So look at it on a tablet or on a mobile device. See how that impacts where the language is gonna show up in relation to the collection of that phone number, and you want it as close to that phone number as you can get it. So what you hear Rebecca saying is what's things you all know about, A-B testing, right? A lot of times the compliance team will tell you, it'd be better if you did this. It's, it's going back to engineering. Everything's a concept of risks and mitigations, right? We all now know that we can't get the risk to zero. So we're just, and we're talking about a very easy statute to plead, and we're talking about plaintiff's firms lining up to sue people, right? So what are the risks and the mitigations? Some of those risks we can't deal with in the short run. We can, we can deal with the plaintiff's for, uh, firms in the long run. And by the way, you know, Jernia's solution for a professional plaintiff's firm, when you show them playback and you can hit a button and get that within, back within eight hours in front of some professional plaintiff, they will go bother somebody else. 
um, which is great, because then they're at least out of your network. We haven't killed them, but they're at least out of your network or maybe out of my network. Um, so, but it, it, you know, in terms of risks and mitigations, it, sometimes when it's coming from the compliance team, you're like, this can't possibly matter. Um, I think you've all got great compliance teams. They believe that it matters. A, B, test it. If you come back and it's like, this is just killing us, right? This is just killing us in terms of conversions. That's the start of a conversation. I mean, compliance doesn't want to be the department of no. Everybody wants to be ultimately accelerating revenue, right? Mm -hmm. It's just about getting the data so we can do, you know, collectively risks and mitigations. But before you tell your compliance person it's going to kill your business, make sure you have the data to support that. Yeah, uh, you'll get to a better answer. <laughs> um, so one of the things that was brought up, I think, in the, in the group in the big room, uh, was uh, if you don't get TCPA consent, does that mean you can't contact somebody? And what's the answer? Can you, you, can you contact somebody if you don't have TCPA consent? Yes. yes. We're just talking about the mechanism. So they haven't fallen out of the funnel, right? If you run a call center, it can be super complicated. You know, turn off the auto dialer and we'll just hand dial all the numbers. Like, that doesn't really scale. Um, but, but again, it's not whether or not you have TCPA consent, valid or otherwise, it's just you're routing that traffic, right? And then how much is it worth it to you to process, you know, that stream different from another stream? Um, so there was a couple other myths we wanted to, to cover here or words that don't mean what you think they mean. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what does the word auto dialer mean? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> well, um, so this is probably the fourth panel I've done in the year since the DC Circuit heard, um, heard the arguments and the appeal of the um, FCC's ruling of July of 2015. And every time I sit in front of a panel, I say the same thing. The next time I see you, hopefully we'll have a decision and I can tell you the answers to these questions and, and other ones. But it is literally the 19th, I think, is a year since the court heard oral argument. And so we sit still waiting. So what, what, what is the state of what's an auto dialer today? You know, the two issues that came out of the FCC ruling um, had to do with, there is some version of human intervention that will take uh, a, 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 dial a dialer out of the ATDS definition, but no clear guidance on what human intervention is. And then the other issue that everyone struggles with is that word capacity. What does capacity mean? Is it present or actual capacity, or is it future capacity? So that's really kind of where where the, where the uh, ACA is sort of asking for guidance from, from the FCC, I mean, from, from the court. I mean, I think um, one of, there was a case that came out a couple of weeks ago, and maybe this is just lawyer humor and nobody else will find this humorous, but. Um, Entirely possible. <laughs> highly possible. Um, but, um, you know, if you have to read legal opinions for a living, they're generally dry and you don't really get much sort of, much sort of lightheartedness in it. But a, a district court, a district judge out in Minnesota was asked to decide whether, um, whether a system used by the defendant was an auto dialer. And, uh, you know, when you're in law school, you learn that all the good stuff in a case is in the footnotes and you really should be analyzing the footnotes. So footnote number one to his opinion is a quote from Through the Looking Glass where he basically says that they have sent them down this rabbit hole and he has this very, very funny quote about how, you know, he has no idea what these people are talking about as they try to figure out whether something is or is not an auto dialer. And I, I found it sort of, you know, kind of apropos of what we're all waiting to hear. I, so, know, I know what it is. That, you know that it is? phone booth where you go in mm -hmm. that we talked about this morning and you dial the number three, okay, that is definitely not an auto dialer. <laughs> so like that, but, in all, but in all serious is like, unless you got humans on rotary dial, you're auto dialing them. So you can start routing stuff as if TCPA doesn't comply, but you might, for the present purpose, assume that that's a null set. Um, partial revocation, another null set? So partial revocation, and uh, the, this issue came up for us to talk about because it's a, another case that where the court ruled that a plaintiff can partially revoke consent. And in the particular case, the consumer said, got a call from uh, a, a client claimed to be using an automatic telephone dialing system and the plaintiff said, don't call me during the day. You can call me at night, you can call me in the morning, just don't call me during the day. And so the court was asked to decide whether you can partially revoke your consent. And the court said yes. So yes, that's perfectly fine. You can revoke their cons uh, her consent in that fashion. For People who are dialing, the question is, what should you do with that, right? 
Zero well, the out. easy, most conservative answer is there's no such thing. Partial revocation, they revoke consent, don't call them using an automatic dialing system. Now, I can hear people at my clients in the marketing department coming up going, wait a minute, Terry. That's a lost potential conversion. Why can't I give them a call? Well, you can. One, as Marty suggested, you can call them using, you know, a manual dialing, right? And maybe you can use your auto dialer, but the, the real question is going to be whether or not you've got the, the ability to manage that, to set your dialer to manage different types of revocation. So she says, don't call me during the day. The next person's gonna say, don't call me at night. The other person's gonna say, don't call me on Tuesday. There's no real good process to manage partial revocation. So the short, that's the long answer, is No, it? no, that's cool. The long <laughs> answer is, there's no such thing. Right, or, or again, <laughs> to put in the language, it's just risks and mitigations, right? The, the key thing is not letting the chief compliance person or the CFO or, God forbid, the CEO, because um, I was talking one here earlier, like, <laughs> she's like, what do I have to do to solve this problem? And you're like, you, you okay. mitigate risks. This is not a, this is, the unwanted phone call problem doesn't get solved. It gets mitigated. And just like, you know, some of the other tech that's coming down the pike from, you know, our sponsor and otherwise, it's, it's minimizing the number and the ways in which you contact people so that you're contacting them when and how they want to be contacted. So the unwanted phone call thing is, again, just a subset of that bigger thing that we're all trying to do. And not to interrupt, but I think the other thing is trying to figure out what to do if you are a company that has a, you know, a, a, a lot of TCPA litigation and how you deal with the firms that are, are you know, starting claims against you and, and your strategy about how you handle those cases once you've got them. I think also as you know, been in enough of these panels, some companies take an approach where they, they settle. It's a cost of doing business and they settle all of their claims. Some companies take an approach where they say if they have a firm that's been suing them a lot, you know, we're not gonna engage with you because you know, we engage with you and we settle with you, we just get more lawsuits. So I think, you know, and, and you know, that's sort of the legal teams, just, you know, kind of where we weigh in or compliance weighs in. But, but that's something else to be thinking about is if you can't stop the flow of the litigation and it becomes just part of doing business, is what do you do once you get it that might help, might help manage how, you know, whether it's going to keep coming or not, which has nothing to do with whether you have great compliance, pro, you know, processes in place. It's what do you do once you get sued. Right. And I want to come back to Rebecca, but what it made me think of is a wise person once told me years ago, Never solve a problem you can avoid. You should work very hard to try to do that. So I think, you know, we're talking about people and processes and tech, you can't get to zero, right? But I would submit to you that the mitigation on the front end, investing in the mitigation on the front end of not having the problem, because uh, there, there are some unavoidable problems, the plaintiff's firms, and otherwise you're just gonna have, you know, mistakes will get made, right? Because nothing's 100%. Um, you know, uh, investing in a little technology so, so the problems don't get in the funnel um, can be a good investment. And it's one that you can spread, you know, across your network. Uh, we were talking earlier, you know, some of these solutions, you can impose them uh, further upstream, right? You, you can get the benefit of the tech without having to run all the tech yourself. You can get access to the data without having to be responsible for pulling the data together. Um, and uh, I, I know there's some things that aren't ready for prime time yet, but I, I know that Trinaya and some of the people in this room are working in other ways to you know, mitigate not just the TCPA problem, but the uh, you know, never solve a problem you can avoid, bigger problem. Um, Rebecca, what else do we have for people, thing people think exist but don't really exist? Reassign. We're gonna talk about reassign Resign numbers here? Yes. All right, great, I'm glad I remember the queue. Um, <laughs> So how many people in this room think when you get consent, you get consent to call the number versus the person? So how many people think you get consent to call the number? I used to. All right, how many people think you get consent to call the person? You get consent to call the person. So what that means is, the person, not the number, but so what that means in the context of reassigned numbers is that when that number is reassigned to a new person, you no longer have the consent, right? So here's the great thing that the, uh, the FTC did it in 2015 in July of 2015, they essentially said, you get one bite at the apple and calling a reassigned number. Um, and that doesn't mean one bite at the apple to call the reassigned number and the person answers and tells you that you have the wrong number. That means you get, you get one pass to call the number one time and you have to figure out on that one time somehow or another that this number has been reassigned. But they don't tell you how to figure out whether or not the number has been reassigned, right? So 
what are some ideas? One of the ideas is if you do get a voicemail, you would have the person you know, who made the call continue to listen through the voicemail to determine whether or not that's the person who signed up. Doesn't really sound that workable. Um, there are certain databases. I think Newstar is one of the vendors that provides them that you can sign up for in perfect. Um, so there's a lot of risk there. About 37 million numbers are reassigned each year. Um, so it's a, it's a more difficult problem to solve, and I think that it's something we're going to have to continue to work through. Yeah, right. the, the one call safe harbor, it, it, it's not much of a safe harbor because if you dial the number and there is no answer, that's your one call. Every call thereafter, you're liable for under the TCPA. So again, just comes back, broken record, risks and mitigations, right? Uh, there's no absolute answer, uh, and it's Kaizen. I mean, you, and I think the benefit of this gathering is we've all got different ways that we try to mitigate these risks. Um, you know, participate in Leeds Council because we've got 16 people all trying to mitigate this risk and other risks, uh, and trying to figure out a way to do it. Um, and you know, sometimes that can be a shield against liability or you know, sharing information so that we identify people that really aren't consumers, people that are just getting up in the morning that cause problems to cash checks. Um, I think we have the ability to run longer, but the biggest gift you can get of anybody is the gift of time. And I think Ross, we were originally supposed to be done at three o'clock, is that correct? You probably delegate this to a minion. Yeah. Um, that's all right, so and it's a little warm in this room, at least up here. Um, so if, if there are any questions or topics, we can cover it in this larger forum, or you can buttonhole any of us, uh, most of us at the bar immediately after this. Only if you're buying. <laughs> we good? One qu here's a question. Uh, from the, the in-house counsel lawyers, uh, what are your particular stances on prior express written consent and prior uh, express consent? So prior, prior ex express written consent are sort of the, the, these heightened standards that came about in, in October of 13 for our making, you know, marketing, marketing calls. So I don't know what you mean by what are my stance, but I mean, we, we will only dial with prior written, ex express written consent. Um, I think the prior express consent standard is still kind of a, applicable in, in the collection space. This, the, you can have sort of, you can get consent at a little bit of a lower threshold than you can have for when you have a, um, you're having a market, you know, a marketing call. Um, is that, but, yeah. Uh, a checkbox would be considered written consent, correct. So it's a voice recording, by the way. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a strange, but express written consent, consent doesn't includes have to be written. A, a recorded voice, uh, message um, where the caller gave uh, consent on the call. You just have to preserve the recording. Anything else in this forum? Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.